welcome back in this lecture we will elaborate some aspects of photoelectrochemical systems a particularly good manuscript even though it's a bit dated it was published in 2001 is this review paper by michael gretzel um, it's extremely well written paper so people who are working in this area is if we are undertaking research um, it's a very productive paper for you to uh, internalize uh, much of this material at least within the scope of this class has been taken from uh, the usual reference that we use for this course so we are looking at two different ways of utilizing solar energy and coupling that with chemical systems. In one system, we are capturing solar energy via semiconductor. The band bending that exists at the semiconductor electrolyte interface is useful for converting solar energy to electrical power. So this hole reacts with a reduced species, generating an oxidized species. The oxidized species gets transported here and combines with an electron and generates the reduced species at this electrode. So the electron that was generated because of the absorption of photon gets transferred via a wire and reacts with the oxidized species to generate a reduced species at this electrode. So here, no new chemicals are generated in a net cycle because the same species is being shuttled between the two electrodes. The overall conversion is that solar energy is utilized for generating electrical power. So if you didn't open the system and understand it, it would just be like uh, a solar cell. You can also use a different approach. Here, you are driving an endothermic reaction. That endothermic reaction is splitting water into oxygen and hydrogen. So in this electrode, the photoanode hole reacts with water generating O2 here and of course protons also and two electrons. The two electrons are uh, what are being transferred to the valence band and the proton gets transported across the electrolyte, reacts with the electrons and generates H2 here. So this is a way of utilizing solar energy and to drive an endothermic reaction and generate, let's say, chemicals or fuels, right? So hydrogen is a fuel. So this approach is often called as solar fuel generation and hydrogen being the most common uh, fuel that is attempted uh, using this approach. All these things face challenges. And the efficiency of these approaches depends upon the extent to which the semiconductor system can absorb uh, light and the extent to which the electron hole that is being generated can be separated to undertake these electrochemical reactions at the interface of the semiconductor and electrolyte. All these things are elaborated in this very nice uh, manuscript. Please look at this. So we had already looked at certain aspects in the previous lectures. Uh, we had looked at what we mean by de depletion width. So in this region of semiconductor electrolyte interface, in the depletion region, there is band bending. So the light that is impinging on semiconductor generates an electron hole pair because of band bending 
the hole moves in one direction and electron moves in the opposite direction. So this is critical because the photocurrents are dependent on uh, minority carriers. All these things were, uh, were discussed in a previous lecture. So in addition to depletion width, we are going to be introducing another quantity called diffusion length. Mm -hmm. Let's clarify this. So when you generate electron hole pair, the holes have to get to the semiconductor electrolyte interface. So this is a photo anode, let's say with n-type photo anode. The holes have to get to the interface of the semiconductor electrolyte and holes are combined uh, with some species in the electrolyte. So holes have to be transferred in this uh, direction to this interface. In contrast, the electrons have to get to this areas, these areas of uh, the semiconductor so that they can be transferred to the counter electron. So this distance that is here indicated as LP is the distance uh, the exciton, that is the electron hole pair, have to be separated so that they can be utilized, right? That is the holes have to go in this direction and the electrons have to go in this direction uh, so that the electron can be removed via the wire to get to the counter electrode. So this distance, the distance um, within which um, the electron hole pair are not recombined is called the diffusion length. If uh, so, this uh, sort of uh, is a measure of carrier lifetime. If the carrier lifetime is large, the diffusion length is also typically uh, uh, large. Okay, so the greater the diffusion length the more easy it is to separate the electron hole pair to do some uh, chemistry with the electron and hole. So in a good system, that is in an efficient semiconductor system, you will have greater diffusion length and so that the electron hole pair that is generated can be easily separated. Mm -hmm. Let's uh, move on. So these two are important features of a semiconductor electrolyte interface. These can be measured um, in the system one is looking at. Mm -hmm. So we will look at some aspects that is going to give you insight into the nature of photocurrent. In the previous lectures, we had seen that the majority carrier dark current increases under forward bias. Um, so for n-type semiconductor, uh, this is electron is the uh, majority carrier. And with the forward bias, the majority carrier current under dark conditions increases exponentially. Mm -hmm. Also, the majority carrier current is not sensitive to reverse bias. So even if you're on the reverse bias condition, even if you change the extent of reverse bias, the majority carrier current is not changing that dramatically. So this is one aspect of, uh, these two are aspects of majority carrier currents. As opposed to this behavior, minority carrier whole dark currents increases with reverse bias. So this is the minority carrier current. So we are looking at an n-type um, uh, type semiconductor. With reverse bias, the band bending increases. So the minority carrier current can be increased when the reverse bias is increased. All these as aspects of minority carrier and majority carrier currents have to be placed when in the context of photocurrents to understand the nature of photocurrents. Let's let me clarify further what we mean by that statement. So I 
have a semiconductor electrolyte interface. I conduct an experiment um, wherein this is observed. That is, this is the current under dark condition when there is no light and I change the bias. The dark current increases exponentially in this direction. So that seems to be due to majority carrier current. Here, it is more or less independent of the bias. So this current in this region is because of minority carriers. Then these two curves are to do with photo uh, current under light condition. That is, I'm increasing the light intensity with light intensity in this region the current increases. So photo current seems to be increasing with light intensity. But in this region, uh, the under light intensity, the current is not uh, increasing that much. So when you look at this region and put all these things that is the features of majority and minority carriers together with these observations, what it suggests is that the photo current is because of minority carriers, right? Because the minority carriers are the ones that, in the, let me put it just step one, one take one step uh, backward. So, Majority carrier current is not sensitive to reverse bias, right? So in this, even though under light intensity, your current increases, while you change the bias, the current is not dramatically changing, right? So what you can infer from this observation placed under taking into account these characteristic of minority carrier and majority carriers, what you can infer is that the photo current is mainly due to minority carriers. Yeah. All right. So when you have the overall current, the there, are, there can be two kinds of uh, currents, right? One is a photo current that depends upon minority uh, carriers uh, that seems to be oxidative in nature for this n-type uh, semiconductor because minority carrier current is because of holes and the majority ca carrier uh, current from the dark condition is because of electrons. Uh, that would be cathodic in nature, right? Because the electrons would transfer across the semiconductor to the electrolyte across that interface. So these two are opposite in uh, nature. Notice that light does not significantly affect majority carrier current. If this is not, this is the region uh, wherein we focus on majority carrier current with increase in light intensity this is not significantly affected. So this equation that was derived for majority carrier current under dark condition is still applicable even in the presence of light. However, the photocurrents is because of minority carrier current. And as you increase the light intensity from dark to some light intensity, to some increased light intensity, that increases. So both these things are added and uh, the nature of minority carrier current is of course different from the nature of majority carrier current. For an type semiconductor, the minority carrier current would be because of holes getting transferred from the semiconductor to the electrolyte, whereas for majority carriers, uh, in uh, n-type semiconductor are electrons that be electrons getting transferred from semiconductor to the electrolyte. So 
both these contrasting currents are added together. So the efficiency of this conversion depends on few features. An important feature is recombination. That is, once you've generated electron and hole, they should not recombine. They should it, it should be possible to separate them and then utilize them for doing some electrochemistry. So recombination has to be suppressed. And the semiconductor should be capable of absorbing light, right? Uh, that has we have looked at that feature in some earlier lecture that would depend upon absorption coefficient, right? This is something like uh, the Beer-Lambert's law. Uh, so the greater the absorption coefficient, more light will be absorbed by the semiconductor. In addition, there are, uh, in addition to absorption coefficient and recombination, there are few other features that give rise to the magnitude of photocurrent. An important uh aspect is called the diffusion length because the photocurrent is because of the minority carriers so the diffusion length in an n-type semiconductor uh, is defined based on the diffusion length of the minority carriers which are the holes so the definition of diffusion length is square root of diffusion coefficient of the minority carriers, that is the holes in the semiconductor, times carrier lifetime. So this has a unit of meter squared by second. Uh, this has a unit of time. So it is unit-wise consistent. We are not deriving this expression because this is a, a extremely interesting um, concept that was first demonstrated by Haynes and Shockley uh, in 1948. These were in the early days of semiconductor physics. That's a very interesting uh, video. Uh, if you search the YouTube, there's a black and white video wherein this experiment and derivation is elaborated by uh, Shockley and Haynes uh, themselves. Uh, it's worth uh, listening to where this demonstrates how to bring together concepts of semiconductor physics with concepts that are typically dealt with in chemical engineering and material science. Uh, but we're not deriving this, but we are just giving the formula for diffusion length. And then there is another equation. Again, we are not deriving this equation, but we're just providing the results uh, from of this analysis. This equation is called Gartner equation. Again, this was derived in early days of semiconductor physics in 1959. What this formula suggests is that the photocurrent is equal to, uh, is directly proportional to light intensity. Um, and then this is the diffusion length and uh, this, is the, uh, this is the depletion length, this is the diffusion length. So the photocurrent, the maximum photocurrent can be this when this term goes to zero. And if you want to increase the photocurrent, you have to suppress this term. So as you can see, if LP increases, uh, that is one way of, that is the diffusion length increases, you can increase the photo. Another way of making this small, this whole term small, is by increasing alpha, that is by increasing the absorption coefficient of the semiconductor, or by having greater depletion width in the semiconductor. If these two terms are larger, this term will anyway be a small quantity. Therefore, you'll get more photocurrent. Or if LP is large, that is the diffusion length is large, this entire term will be smaller. So this gives you a general idea of the 
on what factors does the photocurrent depend on? So there is an important quantity that is often specified called the quantum E, right? So this is uh, in the denominator is the amount of light that is being um, shined onto a, a semiconductor. Recall the meaning of this quantity. This refers to the amount of photons per unit area per unit time. So if you want to get it converted to current, you have to multiply by unit of charge to get the photocurrent. So in this definition is a measure of photocurrent that you can obtain divided by, in some ways, the maximum photocurrent that you can obtain uh, because this is the light that is to the semiconductor exposed to certain light intensity that is provided by this quantity. If all the light is converted to photocurrent, the quantum yield will be one. But in general, uh, quantum meal is uh, less than one. So the important thing here is this provides an idea of the central quantity um, on which the photocurrent depends on. The photocurrent depends upon, um, let's say, recombination lifetime, the diffusion coefficient of minority carrier carriers because for an n-type semiconductor, the holes are the ones that are contributing to photocurrent. It would also depend upon the diffusion length. Similar analysis can also be done for an n-type semiconductor. In that case, the majority carrier current is anodic in nature and the minority carrier current is cathodic in nature. That is what we mean by that is in an n-type semiconductor, the majority carriers, which are holes, when they transfer across the semiconductor electrolyte interface, they would be contributing to anodic processes because they'll be contributing to oxidation. And the minority carriers are electrons when they cross the semiconductor electrolyte interface, they would be contributing to reducing processes, cathodic currents. Let's move on. In a typical high quality semiconductor, by high quality, what we exactly mean is that the diffusion length is much larger than the depletion uh, region. So, Carrier collection, collection is in nearly independent of diffusion length and potential. What do we mean by carrier collect, collection? When you shine light, you are generating an electron hole pair. For an n-type semiconductor, the holes have to reach the semiconductor electrolyte interface so that you can do some uh, chemistry. And the electrons have to reach, have to be pulled out of the semiconductor so that they can be transferred to the counter uh, electrode. So that's what you mean by carrier uh, collection. For a high quality semiconductor, carrier collection is more or less independent of uh, diffusion, depletion region thickness and potential because this is much more uh, than depletion width. It is e easy for hole and electron to be separated so that they can be transferred to two different interfaces. However, for a low quality semiconductor, the diffusion length is much less than that of depletion thickness. So you have to manipulate uh, the depletion uh, width at, and the potential so that you can increase the carrier collection. So in most of the chemical experiments, photochemical experiments, the semiconductor is 
that is generated is via chemical means. No high quality processing is not typically used. So if you have uh, low quality semiconductors, you are in this region. So uh, you have to be playing around with the potential of operation and depletion uh, with thickness. So that increase the carrier collection. There are a few remaining points that you can also look at the open circuit voltage of a photo electrode. This is the overall current expression. At open circuit voltage, the net current is zero. So you can define the O potential for open circuit voltage. The, typically, you define the O potential uh, in this manner. That is the voltage that is measured via a reference electrode and minus this quantity, which is the equilibrium voltage in dark of a particular redox couple. So the redox couple is uh, indicated schematically here. You, depending upon the redox couple you have, you can have a different equilibrium voltage. So this expression is just obtained by putting the overall current to be zero under open circuit condition. So this is another measure of the quality of photoelectrochemical system you have. So the different quantity, when you generate a photoelectrochemical system, there are many features of the system you would try to measure. Uh, in, For example, in the previous lecture, we talked about the mod Schottky plot. That gives you uh, information about donor density and flat band potential. Another measure is the OCV of a photoelectrode. Uh, In the next lecture, we will look at different specific configurations of a photoelectrochemical cell. Thank you.